All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program. And we're glad you can join us for today's session on if we're smarter than the average corn borer or corn rootworm. So we're going to be talking about corn insect pests here. These sessions are brought to you by University of Minnesota Extension, as well as generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research Promotion Council, as well as the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. I'm Anthony Hansen, a regional extension educator in integrated pest management based out of Morris. And today we're welcoming Dr. Fei Yang. Uh, for folks who haven't been introduced to him yet, he is our relatively new extension corn entomologist at the University of Minnesota. And thank you again, Fei, for being able to visit today with us. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Yang and we'll get started on what's happening in the corn world for our insects. Okay, good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Good. Okay, good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about like two major categories of corn insect pests, European corn borer and corn rootworm complex. I will talk about its resistance status, especially to the BD technology, and also its management strategies for these two different insect pests. My name is Fei Yang. I'm the new assistant professor and corn extension entomologist here at the University of Minnesota. So today, I will talk about these corn insect pests. As we know, the major corn insect pests in Minnesota can be divided into two different like, categories uh, from two different orders, Lepidoptera and Coleoptera. So for Lepidoptera insect pests, we have a traditional old insect pest here, European corn borer, but we have new problems. We have resistance problems right now. So I will talk a little bit more detail about European corn border in today's talk. And also we have some other insect pests like a corn earworm, armyworm, and black cutworm. These are micro insect pests from southern states every year. So for today's talk, I will not cover these different lepidoptera insect pests. And another important insect pest from Coleoptera, we have rootworm complex here. We have both Western corn rootworm and the Northern corn rootworm. Here we show some pictures of the adults of these two species. And the most damaging stage is the larvae of these corn rootworm. They can feed on your roots and they can damage your corn plants. And you can see uh, the top, the right top of the picture, the roots was almost eat, eaten by the corn rootworm larvae. So first I will talk about the European corn borer we also call it ECB. ECB is the old, like traditional, but it is significantly insect pest in the US. Actually, the BD technology was first introduced, was used to control this pest because this pest caused substantial yield losses and economic damage. So here I put some pictures. You can see the adults of the European corn borer and the most damaging stage is the larvae. And if you can see those larvae, they cause severe damage on the stalks. And also it can feed on the corn ears and eat lots of kernels. So the ECB can cause the injury in corn by the yield loss and by eating on the brick and also the ears. And also indirect infestation for rust and uh, mycotoxin contaminations. And all these will contribute negative effects for our like a year. So European Cambodia is a typical lepidopter insect. It has four different uh, developmental stages. So the adult will lay eggs and these eggs can hatch to the larvae and these larvae will derive from first instar to fifth instar and then these larvae will become pupae and finish one life cycle. So the most damaging stage is the larva stage. As I mentioned, these larvae can feed on your corn stalk and also can feed on your corn ears. So based on the generation per year, we have two different like, types of European corn borer. The first we call it univoting. This kind of European corn borer, we only have one generation per year. So the overwintering larvae will become pupae in early like spring and become adult. And these adults will lay eggs. And these eggs will hatch to the larvae and these larvae will eat in your corn fields. But the late instar larvae will go die pause during winter time and they will hatch and they will become like a pupae next season. And the second type is mud voting. So that means we have multiple generations per year. In Minnesota, we probably have two generations per year and the, similarly, those like overwintering larvae will become pupae and then develop to the adult. So they finish the one life cycle to the like uh, the larva stage. And the larva will become again, become 
like pupae, adult, and lay eggs. And these eggs will hatch and they will damage again in your cornfield. So the, as I mentioned, the ECB is not very, very common right now. You can seldom see in your field because of the BD technology. So here on the right hand, we can see the populations of ECB from Minnesota, Illinois, and Wisconsin before and after the introduction of the BT technology. And the vaccine is a, like a large density. And I marked like with a red circle, these are the population density after introduction of the BT technology. And we can see the population density is significantly reduced compared to the introduction, before the introduction production of the BD technology. So in general, the transgenic BD cone has provided excellent control efficacy for ECB for almost 27 years. You, with this technology, it's not only benefit for the like BD cone growth, and it also benefit for the like non-BD cone growth because with the BD technology, the ECB overall in the, in the area is suppressed. The overall population is very low. So for the successful, there are several reasons for the successful of the ECB suppression with the BT cone. First, we have a very strong resistance monitoring program and we monitor the survivability of these ECB insects to different BT proteins. And once we found some resistance problem, we will, we will take some strategies to, con to control these resistant populations and make sure these resistance genes are not spread at other places. And also we have like high dose refugee strategy. That means the Bt concentration in the Bt plant is very high. They can kill almost all the susceptible or uh, heterozygous ECB cone root worms. And also we have refugee. That means we have these refugee that non-Bt cone, we can maintain some susceptible insects. And these susceptible insects are very important for slowing down the evolution of resistance. And also we have pyramiding strategy. That means we have multiple Bt proteins from CRY1, and also we have one Bt protein from CRY2. These are with different mode of actions, which can help slow down the evolution of resistance. So as I mentioned, the major threat for the long-term use of the Bt technology is the evolution of resistance. And unfortunately in 2018, in our neighboring country, we found like ECB populations showed resistance to crab alpha BT cone in several fields in Nova Scotia. And these are the pictures shared by our scientists in Canada. And they collect the larvae from a one BT cone field expressing crab F. And they test these like populations against the purified insect side BT proteins in the lab. And the top two here on the picture, these are the so several population as a reference. And the bottom picture is you have like several lines. These are field populations. And then we can see across these concentrations of CRY1 FBD protein, the mortality for the susceptible reference populations almost 100%. However, for the um, field populations, we see here the mortality was very low. So that means the these field populations show sig re significantly reduced susceptibility to the CRY1 FBD protein and uh, they have evolved the resistance. That's the reason why we see so much severe damage in the field for the BT cone field to crop one F. So because like uh, the first detection of crop one F resistance in 2018, and also if resistance is spread everywhere, that will cause management strategies for the resistance for the BT cone, because once the resistance is established, if we don't take any measures, the resistance can spread everywhere. So during 2019 to 2020, the scientists in Canada, they extend their survey to check the resistance problems of the ECB populations to crown FBD protein. And they sampled a total of 23 fields and they found like 12 fields or 12 populations showed the resistance to crown FBD cone with 10 populations in Nova Scotia and one in Quebec and one in Manitoba. And also they found that these populations not only showed resistance to the crow one f Bt protein, they also showed resistance to other Bt proteins, such as crow one ab Bt protein, crow one a 105 Bt protein, and also crow 2 ab 2 Bt proteins. That means these populations 
evolved resistance to almost every single BD protein in the market for control over the ECB population. So here is another like a field uh, with severe damage by the ECB. This, this hybrid expressed two BD proteins, both CRA1F and CRA1AB. And we found like about 10 to 15% of the plants were severe damaged by ECB larvae. So here I would like to emphasize like two locations, as I mentioned, during the resistance monitoring by the scientists in Canada. They found that like a, the resistance population one in Manitoba and one in Quebec, because these two locations are very close to the mainland US. And also because ECB is a mobile insect, the mouse can migrate a long distance. So because of resistance in these areas in Canada, so it's very high chance these mouse can migrate to the mainland US and establish the resistant population in some locations in the United States. And it will cause problems for the BT resistance management for the US congruence. And actually, during last year, with a monitoring and the field in Connecticut. So we found like a resistance population of ECB to CRA1A15 and CRA2AB2, Svitcon, and the, the field was severe damage. That means resistance is already in the United States. And this is just on purpose for resistance monitoring. But for other locations, we don't know. So it's high chance these resistance populations may be already migrated into different other different locations in the, in the United States. So Faye, one question for you, uh, back yes. on that map you had. So those Manitoba populations are pretty close to our Minnesota border. Um, do you have any background on how far, have people done flight tests on European corn borer, how far does it migrate in a given year on average? Uh, is there any information on that? I don't have like specific data for like how far these like moss can travel, but like it's very easy. So you see here the population, the initial resistance population found like in Nova Scotia here, and they can travel very far until like Manitoba. So it's based on like distance in Canada. So it's very easy for these populations to migrate into the US different locations, as long as the environment is good for these insects to survive. So here is another population I collected uh, uh, last year in Crookston, Minnesota. It's a, it's a non-BT field, okay? It's not like a BT field. So we sampled about like 1,000 plants uh, in, during October last year, and we found about like 30 to 35% of these non-BT con were damaged by ECB. So this su suggests we still have some hotspot of ECB populations in the field. And we collected about like a, around like a 130 to 140 ECB larvae and rear them in the, in the lab. Because as I mentioned before, the late insta larvae of ECB will go down past during winter time. So we collect these larvae in the, in the lab. So we put them into artificial dart and we rear them in the lab. We use like a long light. We use like 18 hours day and a six hours night to break the diapause of these uh, larvae. And they can divide the pupae, and these pupae we are putting in rearing containers, and these they can lay eggs. So they, they eggs on this wax paper. And I'm marked with a red circle here, and you can see so these like a yellow clusters. These are the eggs of the European Kambar. So we collect these eggs and put them in bags. And then after two or three days, these eggs will hatch. And you can see these very tiny black neonates. So the neonates means all these like insects larvae were hatched within 24 hours. So we will use these neonates for the bioassay and test them against like a different Bt proteins to see whether these populations are still susceptible to the Bt proteins. And we rate them after, normally we rate them after seven days to check the, the mortality and the late developmental stages. So here is a summary of our data from last year samples. We tested the population not only in Minnesota, but we also got some populations from Wisconsin. So we tested these population against all the available Bt proteins in the market, including three CRA1 Bt proteins, CRA1F, CRA1AB, CRA1 over 5 and another like uh, model of action, CRA2AB2. And the top population, ECB, BZSS, that's a susceptible population as a reference. And we 
test them and we calculate the mortality and we calculate the LC50 based on the mortality. So we can see the, the LC50 here and uh, finally we calculate resistance ratio. So resistance ratio is calculated based using the LC50 of a field population divided by the LC50 of the susceptible population. Resistance ratio is like a, a, a indicator for resistance monitoring program. If resistance ratio is more than 10, that means resistance is in the field. However, if it is less than 10, that means this, most of these populations are still susceptible to these BD proteins. So based on real results, we can see the resistance ratio all of them are less than two. That means all these populations are susceptible to all the Bt proteins. And also based on the confidence interval of the LC50 value, we have here 95 confidence interval. If the confidence interval overlapped compared to the susceptible population, that means no differences for the LC50. If it's not overlapped, that means significant differences for the susceptibility against the different Bt proteins. And we found that all the LC50 like confidence limit either overlapped or less than the LC50 value of the susceptible. So based on these data, and we conclude all the field populations sampled during 2023 in Minnesota and Wisconsin are very susceptible to all the CRIBD proteins in the market right now. So that's good news for our growers. So one question on that last table, okay. um back down to the CRI1A105, uh, basically that's saying it um, takes twice as much uh, BT to kill off at 50%. Um, so for that resistance ratio, is there a point where you're starting to be concerned if it gets above a certain number? Or I know the statistics are kind of working to what's significantly different, but is there a point where you're you know, really starting to kind of sound the alarm bells if you're seeing a high resistance ratio? Yeah, so for resistance ratio, normally, as I mentioned, a, a good indicator is less than 10. So we use 10 as a critical value. So if it's Less than 10, normally it's not a big concern, like for the field uh, resistance. So if we more than 10, we need to con we need to concern about the less population. And also, if we find something like a more than 10, we, we need to confirm these insects can survive on the whole plants to make sure they can complete their life cycle. If sometimes you, you can see the resistance ratio is more than 10, and when you test those like uh, offsprings of this popul population, in the whole plants, they cannot survive. That means these populations are still susceptible to the Bt proteins in the expressed by the, the Bt plants in the field. So this is just the first step for resistance monitoring. So if the resistance ratio more, less than 10, we don't take any like additional steps. But if it's more than 10, we will do some additional experiments to confirm the resistance. So we also use another like technique we call it like F2 screening. So we collect the larvae from the field and uh, we do single pairing, male and female, and test them into the F2 generation. In this way, if there's any resistant genes or resistance alleles in the population, we can isolate this resistant genes and the resistant population. And we can see the survivors if we have the resistant genes in the F2 generation. So based on the, this technique, we test them on like uh, different diagnostic concentrations for different Bt proteins. For CRO1F, we use a 16 nanogram per square centimeter. And for CRO1AB, 11.2. And for cro one o five we have 20. And also for cro 2 ab 2 we have 180. Also... Based on this study, we didn't find any insects survived on this diagnostic concentration. That means that we didn't have any resistance alleles from these populations. So for the because like uh, we don't have any like survivors. So that means there's no resistance earlier for these populations sampled from the field. So that's good news. That means resistance earlier frequency is still very low in the field for ECB. So here is a summary for ECB. This figure is a like, we did like every year for statewide survey for the damage by ECB and for the gray area, that means no damage. And for the green, either light green or dark green, that means we have moderate like damage of the ECB. But overall, the field population of ECB damage is still very low. But as I mentioned, we still have some hotspots for the ECB. So for management, you need to know your field. 
if you, especially you have like a, a long history of infestation for that field and you use the like non BT for a long period of time. And also if you plant early or late and then you will attract some ECB mouse to lay eggs in your field. So the major concern right now for resistance is uh, in Canada because, and also for the like uh, detection of the resistance in Connecticut. So that means that the resistance is still increasing in the area. So we need to know the resistance status for these like different populations. So that's the emphasis we need to continue our effort for resistance monitoring. So here is a like a barcode. If you find some ECB population in the field, I would like to request to report to us and we can get some populations and the test the populations for you in the future. And also you can email me if you find some activity of ECB in your fields. So with that, I'd like to talk about our second category of insects today. It's a Western and a Northern Cone Worm. We have these species in Minnesota. So as I mentioned, the most damaging stage for like a Western Cone, Northern and the Northern Cone Worm is Live state because these larvae can feed on your roots and cause like a damage for your cone. And uh, normally we have three instars of these larvae in your fields and then they will develop to pupae after three instars. So these larvae can directly reduce your yield because these larvae affect the roots for the water and the nutrition uptake and uh, make the these like a cone plant looks like very unhealthy. And also it has like an indirect negative effect for your yield. And because of the like uh, the lodging problem, it will cause problems for the plants, for the photosynthesis and pollination. And uh, this kind of lodging will also cause difficult for the harvest for those like machines. And uh, the damage like by the, and the larvae feed on the roots, they can also along the entry for some root and the passengers contamination that will also cause like negative impacts for your plants. Except for the like uh, larvae, the adults of the rootworm can sometimes damage your cone fields. And here we show some pictures of like uh, the silk clipping by the adults and this will ca cause some kind of uh, like pollination issues. And also the feeding will cause some entrance for sub beetle and the ear mold infestation later. So for Western cone rootworm, this species is a uh, like a most common in the continuous cone in the Western cone belt. So typically the adults of the Western cone rootworm lay really eggs in the cone fields. However, there are some portion of the, like we call a variant, this is like a Western cone rootworm, they can lay eggs in the soybean field this year. So next year, when you rotate it back to the cone and then these eggs can hatch in your cone fields and they will damage your cone. However, we don't have any variant right now documented in the in Minnesota fields. So that's good news. The Western cone rootworm, as we know, they can develop resistance to almost every management tactic. So resistance to different insects, insects has been widely documented for carbamate organophosphate and uh, parasitoids, and also resistance to BT technology has been documented in several different states. So here we summarize like a Western cone rootworm resistance to the BT proteins. So the first field evolved resistance of Western cone rootworm was detected in Iowa to class 3 BB1 BT proteins. So that's only six years after the commercialization of the BT hybrids. And after that, the Western cone rootworm resistance to all the BT proteins, including several class 3 BT proteins and the class 34, 35 AB1 BT proteins has been detected in Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, and Minnesota, et cetera. So here are some like uh, studies showing resistance of Western cone rootworm in Minnesota. They collect the populations from different county, Rosemount, Canby Hills, and also like Brown County. And they test these field populations against the purified PD proteins for several class 3 BD proteins, including class 3 BB1, E class 3 1 AB, and M class 3 A, as well as the second category class 3, 34, 35, AB1, BD proteins. And then they found all these field populations showing like a higher significant survivorship compared to the survival population. That means all these field populations showing significantly reduced survivability or resistance to the three, all these cry BD proteins. 
So the second insect is like a northern cone root worm. In recent years, the population of northern is increasing in the field in both continuous and rotated cone. So compared to the like western cone root worm, the adults of northern are more mobile. So that means these adults can travel like far away uh, from from either from your fields or into your fields. So sometimes you see the populations of northern in your fields, maybe they're not produced from the larvae in your fields, they travel back from other fields. So for the eggs, for these northern, they are more cold tolerant compared to the western cone root worm. And we don't have like a rotation resistance uh, for the northern cone root worm, but we have extended that pulse. So that means the eggs of this northern cone root worm, they will not hatch next year. These eggs can hatch like two years or even like more years later in the fields. So when you rotate it back to cone, so these eggs may hatch and can still damage your cone plants in the field, even if you take like crop rotation. So for resistance to Bt proteins of northern cone root worm, it's not like a western cone root worm. Just a few studies document that like a northern cone root worm has developed a resistance to the Bt proteins. So here are two studies we found like so far. One is in 2019, they found like first population of northern cone root worm showing resistance to both class three and class 34, 35 AB1 in North Dakota. So these populations are collected actually in 2016. And a recent study published in 2023, and they found the northern population collector in Minnesota showing resistance to both class 3 and class 34, 35 AB1 Bt proteins. And these populations are collected in 2019. So here is a little bit like a detail about the population in Minnesota. As I mentioned, this population is collected in 2019 in Mick County. And in this like figures, we have population of susceptible to black bar. And also we have some field populations collected from other states. And this is a cross three BB one Bt protein, and the Y axis are mortality and the uh, instar of the insects. And the, I marked the, year, the red circle. This is the population of our Minnesota population. And if you can see compared to other field populations, also the population, Minnesota population showed a significantly reduced the mortality to cross three BB one Bt proteins. And most of these, like more than 81% of the insects can successfully develop to second insta. That means this population is significantly resistant to the cross three BB1 BD proteins. And hey, there are a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I'll just mention too that I was actually out in Howard Lake yesterday. So getting close to that Meeker County area and a lot of folks talking about Northern corn worm issues. So one of the questions that came up um, that we had submitted here is, Basically, if someone had an issue with northern corn wortworm this year pretty badly, how long is that going to persist? So we talk about extended diapause. Yep, you go through maybe soybean the next year and then corn, you can get hit again. But can they last even longer than that in the soil? Or kind of what's the longevity of these eggs when they have extended diapause? So for the like extended diapause is very complicated. For management of northern corn wortworm, Right now, we don't have any specific data, especially like recently for recent 10 years. We don't know how many like populations showing like extended diapause. So if the extended diapause, like the percentage is low, and if you do like a rotation, and it seems it's still the best way to eliminate the population of like northern cone root worm. And also, we don't know the status for the resistance of these northern cone root worm populations uh, to Bt proteins, not like a Western cone root worm. Western cone root worm is developing resistance almost everywhere to Bt proteins. But for Northern, uh, most of the populations are still susceptible based on previous studies. And we don't know the current status right now. So if the, these populations in your field are still susceptible to the Bt proteins, and you can still plant Bt plants. So these Bt technologies can help you manage these cone root worm populations. And, and if, if the, this, resist, this population is showing some resistance, you can use some other strategies like uh, infant insecticides, and the, those can also help you manage the cone root worm for northerns. So as I mentioned, the northern cone root worm is very complicated right now. We, we, are, we are lacking the data for the like, extended pulse, and we are lacking the, the data for the resistance level right now in the overall, in the overall states. 
So as I mentioned, like uh, this is uh, that population uh, collected from Mikko County. For the like, uh, this is another BT protein, like a uh, class 34, 35 AB1, and they reclassified as GPP 34, TPP 35 AB1 BT proteins. And then we can see this population collected from Minnesota. They also showed a significant reduced mortality compared to the uh, sister population to this BT protein. So here are some gaps for like understanding the Western and the Northern Cone rootworm. And uh, we are trying to uh, conducting these studies uh, in, in, in the future. And the, some of the studies are actually we are currently working in our lab. So first, as I mentioned, we currently we, are, we don't know what's the resistance status, what's the resistance level or resistance ratio um, to CRAS-3 and the GPP AB. 34 AB1 and the TPP 35 AB1 BD proteins, as well as RNA technology across the whole state, especially for the Northern Cone rootworm. So starting this year, we will collect populations and test the population against these BD proteins and get some updated information for their stability to these BD proteins. And also because in most areas, Northern and uh, Western, they coexist in the field. So the competition and the feeding behavior and the tolerance we, we are still lacking, especially for cold tolerance. The previous study was conducted like two decades ago. So we, we need to understand the recent behavior of these insects. And also, as I mentioned, we have like several strategies for control of rootworm, like seed treatments, insecticides, as well as BT traits. So we want to know the interaction of these management strategies for management of cold rootworm, whether they have some additional effects or synergism effects with these different combinations of management strategies. And finally, we want to get some better understanding of the extended virus of con Northern Cone rootworm. So here is uh, one study we are conducting in the lab right now to investigate the competition between Western and the Northern Cone rootworm. So uh, we, we have some like a uh, study collected, uh, data collected already from this, this study in the greenhouse. So what we did, we plant a non BD cone uh, in the greenhouse in each part with one plant. So, and then we, after about like 10 days, we infest the 100 eggs with different uh, egg ratios with like a Western cone rootworm and the Northern cone, cone rootworm. Here we have five like egg ratios from 1% Northern, 25% Western to 75% Northern, 50% Western and 50% Northern. 75% Western and 25% Northern, as well as 100% Western. So we infest all these eggs in the like uh, greenhouse and um, close the monitor their development. And when they are close to emerge, we cut the plants and cage them. So we will collect the adults and the kind of number of these species and also sex them. So here we have like some preliminary data. So we have like two different types of the both West and Northern Corona. The first group is diapers. So that means these populations are diapers population. And the second group on the right hand is a non diapers population. So first, first we focus on diapers population. The green one is a Western Corona worm and the blue one is a Northern Corona worm. The treatment A is 100% Northern Corona worm and the treatment E is 100% Western Corona worm and the B to D a different uh, ratio of Western and the Northern Cone rootworm. And based on the this data, we can see for diapause, it seems like a Western Cone rootworm is more competitive compared to the Northern Cone rootworm. We have like uh, most of the populations from emerged from the greenhouse are Western Cone rootworm. And uh, similarly for the non diapause population, we can see most of the populations we collected are green ones. That means Western Cone rootworm. So that's, these all data suggest that Western cone root worm it seems more competitive to the Northern cone root worm when feeding on the cone roots in the field. So the second study we are currently working on is try to understand the cold tolerance and the super cooling point of the different Western and the Northern cone root worm, especially for those extended diapause and diapause populations. So here, as a previous study conducted about like two decades ago, they found like uh, the Western, like a northern cone rootworm, is more tolerant compared to the western cone rootworm to the cold. So here we can see at like a minus seventeen point five 
25 degree, the Western Congruum X can reach like 100% mortality. However, at this kind of temperature, the Northern Congruum only has 20 to 50% mortality. So we have revisited these kind of uh, characteristics of biology of these species and get some updated data later. I thought I'd chime in really quick, F.A. Uh, so you mentioned like negative 17.5 Celsius. For those uh, that know their Fahrenheit scale better, that's roughly about um, you know zero degrees Fahrenheit. So you know getting pretty yes. cold for soil temperatures there. And uh, we have an article on Minnesota Crop News that came out on talking about a lot of these species, and a lot of our soil temperatures were nowhere near that this year. Uh, I think it was about 27 degrees we had out here in West Central Minnesota for a low soil temperature. So that was one of the questions that actually had come in is uh, what would, what might winter be doing to help out with these insects here? So maybe you're going to talk more about what's going on with this too, but yeah, that's one of the big questions coming up there. So the winter, if like, like this year, if it's warm winter and you don't have too much snow, that means like the soil temperature uh, is higher because like the eggs laid by the root worm, normally like two to uh, four inches like below the soil surface and sometimes can up to eight inches. So the inside of the temperature for this soil is like perfect for the root of eggs. Yeah. However, if like in cold like weather and you don't have like snow covered, so that that, that would help like eliminate lots of the eggs of the root worm and they will help like bring down the field population the field population or the field larvae in the following like uh, spring. But for this season, for this like uh, warm winter and the less snow, I think the population should be high for these eggs. They, 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 their survival can be high. So here are some like uh, possible uh, reasons like can drive the root worm population either up or down. If you have, as I mentioned, if you have a cold open winter and we have saturated soil when these eggs hatch and they can cause like a significant mortality to the eggs. And also if you do late planting and they don't have sources for these high egg hatch, they can also bring down the overall population. And if these like, a, you have like a natural enemies in your field and all these populations are susceptible to the management strategies and then you can bring down the population. However, in the opposite, if, if you have long or warm force and you have like a warm winter and the less snow like this year, and they can increase the population of the uh, hatching rate of these eggs. And also early planting, you can provide like food sources for these hatched larvae. And if you have like high concern, high comb populations and also in the previous year, you found the resistance problems to the management strategy. And all these factors can cause like uh, the population up. So right now for managing of uh, for root worm, we have three tools, like uh, the first and the most important crop rotation. And especially for in Minnesota for Western root worm, because we don't have like a variance. So if you have like a damage in your cornfields, severe damage this year, and the next year you rotate to soybean, you can eliminate almost all the like uh, Western root worms, even for Northern root worm. And we can, the crop rotation is still the best way to control these like uh, Western Northern Congruum X. And the second, we have like a BT traits. So right now, for Western Congruum, they're showing resistance to, uh, sev to several BT proteins, but we have RNA technology. And for Northern Congruum population, and in most populations are still susceptible. So the BT is still work good. And also we have insect size. We can use high rate of seed treatments, and also we can use in feather insect size. And sometimes you can use like chemical insecticides for other control. So here are some like efficacy about like crop rotation for management of root worm. So first we focus uh, some data on Western root worm and uh, for these like uh, the BT cone, the white body is the first year that cone fields and the latter blue body is the second year cone fields and the dark blue body is the third year. Um, three or more years confused. And as you can see, the black bar, the popula overall population is very, very low compared to second year and third year confused. That means crop rotation can significantly reduce the population. However, as I mentioned, these are BT fields and you can see you still have lots of like uh, insects here. That means Western root worm is developing resistance to these BT con traits. And for non-BT fields, similarly, for the first year and even some second year corn fields, we have low population contain, com, contain, compared to those three 
yes, are more confused. And uh, for northern convert worm, and the fox, the first fox on BT confused, and we can see the overall population is low, either for first year confused, second year con, or third, three years are more confused. And for non-BT, and we can see in 2021, 2022, the population is low. However, in 2023, we found the first year confused have the most abundant like uh, northern root worm. That means in this in this field, we have the extended upper problems. Even when you do the rotation, we still have high populations of northern root worm. So overall, these data suggest the rota proper rotation still the best way for management of the northern and the western root worm. So here I have some data for insect trials for management of the convert worm. The red line here is the economic threshold. And we can see most of the insects, if, if, if we talk about like economic thresholds, they are above, except for Aztec and the index. However, when we compare it to those like uh, untreated, we can see they still can bring down uh, the damage caused by the convert worm. So these insect sites can be used for management of your convert worm fields if you have like severe problems. So right now for BT management of convert worm, as I mentioned, we have four BT proteins and the three of them from class three BT proteins and the one from class 34, 35 BT proteins. And also we have one RNI technology. So that means we have three model of actions. So we have like different combinations of these different technologies. We have like smart stack, Smartstack Pro and the VT4 Pro, those con hybrids are available for management of convert worm in our fields. So here is a study we conducted last year in Lambton. We tested the efficacy of different um, BT traits for management of convert worm. So the y-axis are the node injury and the x-axis are the different BT con hybrids. We have two different studies. So I separate here. So we have VT2P, which is no root worm traits. We have SmartStack, which contains only BT proteins and a SmartStack Pro and a VT4 Pro, which contain both BT proteins and RNA technology. So, and we found compared to the VT2P, all the BT technology and the RNA technology can significantly reduce the root, root damage, no damage. And the, when we compare the SmartStack Pro and the VT4 Pro and these two, which contain RNAi technology, it, it seems like it provides better control efficacy compared to SmartStack, which contains only crab proteins. That means like additional RNAi technology, they can provide like a additional control for the root worm damage. So here, uh, are some like a uh, summary for the resistance of both Western and Northern Congo worm. And uh, currently the Western Congo worm is developing resistance to almost all the prior BT proteins. So we have only have RNA technology available. And uh, for Northern, it's on the way for developing resistance to the BT proteins. So that means we, these like uh, BT proteins are dangerous and also like RNA selection pressure is high. That means probably in the very Short, very near future, we can see that resistance to RNA technology. And then there are several like new BD proteins in the, um, on the pipeline that like, try to be commercialized very soon. So we have CRY75 AA and the VIP4 and IPD. These are totally new model of action of the BD protein that can be used for control of uh, um, convert worm. So, for example, we have like uh, CRY75 AA, VIP4, INI, three technologies and the register for MON952758 con hybrids. This is a bad product. It's submitted to EBA, try to be commercialized soon in, in the United States. And also we have another technology from Cotiva with like INI technology and IPD072 AA. These are two uh, different model of actions. So that would be good news for uh, our growers for management of root worm. So for summary of managing of the root worm, so for like effective uh, management of root worm, I think like uh, the scouting is very important. So you can like uh, scout your field for those like beetles, not only just for this year, but also for next year. 
So because like uh, these beetles really acts in your fields, and you can you can see what's the pressure and uh, and what's the problem for your next season. And also we can do like a root evaluation and we can check the damage by roots. And if you have any problems and you can detect if you plant BT traits and if you have damage, that means you have resistance problems. And if we do rotation and you still have the damage, uh, especially you have like a northern cold worm, that means you have extended that part here. So root, root evaluation can provide really good like uh, indications for your future plans. As I mentioned right now, we have like a uh, several strategies that can be used for management of uh, like a uh, convert worm. We have rotation, that's the most effective way. And we have like a uh, BT traits and we have like an uh, insecticide. And the, all these like uh, management strategies can be used in combination based on your own fields. So another thing like you need to remember like for management of root worm, like a root worm is very field specific. You need to know on your own root, on your own fields. Maybe like uh, in this field, you have like a high project in another field that you don't have the project. So it's 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 normal, like a root worm, because especially for Western cone root worm, those like insects are not like uh, very mobile. So they are local in your fields. So with that, I'd like to thank some uh, sponsors for supporting uh, these kind of studies and uh, our programs for Minnesota Congress Association FMC, Cotiva Sanjanta Bay, and also Universal Minnesota Extension. And with that, I'd like to take any questions. And if you want to ask, contact me later. I have an email and a phone number here. And uh, I think that's it. All right, thank you, Faye. We have uh, just about 10 minutes for questions here. So um, I'm gonna lump a few together that I've gotten. So this also goes back to when I was talking to some corn growers yesterday that uh, we you know sometimes deal situations where say you have neighbors that have really high pressure fields with corn rootworm, and then you're finding adults in your field that you're clipping silks. And some people are very much wanting to do something about it. Um, you know, maybe the silks are getting clipped tight enough where you're getting pollination issues, maybe right. not. So that's the question is when is insecticide control either effective for adults, corn rootworms, or justified at all? So for uh, a quick important important like information for like a beetle controlling is the timing. So it, when you can when you use a chemical insecticide to control the beetles, and uh, you must make sure most of the beetles are already mated, especially for those females. And uh, if you control like too early, and uh, you didn't kill any like uh, gravity like females, and later like, those like females can steer like lay eggs in your fields. So the timing is very important. Also, and you need to, as I mentioned, uh, for for management of root worm, you need to know the specific of your own fields. So if you, if if you plan, and you need to know whether these populations are western and and northern, what's the percentage of northern? And if you see like most of them are western, that means if you have a problem this year, and you can and these populations are still susceptible to Bt traits, you can still plant like a Bt corn or use like insecticides for management of them. Even if you have like high populations in your neighboring fields, you can still get better control with this technology. And if like uh, you have lots of them are northern corn rootworm and uh, these northern corn rootworm are extended diapers, so that's that's a problem. And uh, if you use like a non-BT comb, however, as I mentioned, for northern cool most of them are still very susceptible to BT traits. So you can use like the BT traits uh, for management of these cone rootworm in your cone fields. So so management of rootworm species is very like uh, field specific. So you need to very clearly understand your own situation for this field. All right. Uh, one of the other questions I have here is dealing with uh, insecticide resistance. Has that been documented at all for corn rootworm species? So we talked about uh, efficacy a bit already, but um, is there any known resistance to any chemicals? And the, for Western corn rootworm, like a lots of studies have documented they have developed like a resistance to carbamate, organophosphate, and the parasitoids. And also, if like we talk about Bt proteins, and that's also like we call it insecticide Bt proteins. They also develop a widespread resistance to uh, um, all the crab Bt proteins. But for northern, the information 
uh, is limited. We didn't see too much, as I mentioned, we didn't see too much studies report resistance, especially for the BD proteins. So that seems that like still very susceptible. All right, I got a couple questions here on weather. So I'm gonna split these up. So we talked about winter temperatures a little bit. This year wasn't really cold enough to help us out too much. Um, maybe we've had a really cold exposed year without snow. We could have seen some mortality, but how about when we get to rain events in the summer or drought? How does that affect mortality? Uh, we talk sometimes about heavy rains possibly helping us out with corn worm. Um, how does that hold up? And then also we see another drought here. What's that going to do for corn worm? Yeah, I think like first, like for like uh, the heavy rains, especially like uh, during the egg hatching stage. So that will be a help, like uh, kill most of the eggs. So I think we showed some studies uh, like uh, it's not recently, it's published a long time ago. And uh, if you have like a heavy rain in the early spring, that can reduce significantly for uh, uh, hatching rate of those eggs. And for the drought, it the, the situation is very complicated. Sometimes it has like a negative effect. Sometimes it has like a, um, positive effects. So it's it is really depends on the species and its life cycle. So for sometimes like if you have like a, a drought, so you will reduce the survival. Especially for those like insects are very susceptible to the drought. So they can you can cure those like. The populations and also because of the drought, they will reduce uh, the habitat of these insects and also can reduce the food sources. So this will also um, reduce the populations. But on the other hand, sometimes the drought and the, you can do like a shift or change. And for these habitat of the insects, they can resist to this drought and then later they can, the populations may go up. And also for some insects, if they, are, they have some tolerance to the drought, and then they can still um, survive there. And also drought can shift like the geography of these populations because they need to look for food. So the, if especially for those like uh, uh, mobile insects, like uh, for, if for, for example, for the Northern, they may like travel a little bit uh, like uh, uh, to other areas looking for food, for food sources and uh, making the like, population expand in the, in the whole area. All right, next question is on RNAi for these doer traits out there. The, we're seeing a lot of these coming in the pipeline now. Um, are they equally effective, the traits we have, for northern and western corn rootworms, or is there some difference in those uh, uh, efficacies? Yeah, like uh, that's a good question. So for RNA technology, as I mentioned, it's a totally different mode of action. It's not a BT protein. The RNA technology is like called kind of interference of critical genes, like in Western corn we call it SNF7 genes. So this, by this technology, it will silence the expression of these genes. By, by silencing these genes, and uh, the, a critical protein will be not produced. And the result of this critical protein, the, the larvae of the corn they cannot survive. So compared to the BT technology, uh, the RNA technology is a slow killing for the rootworm. The BD technology can kill insects very fast if it's high dose, can kill like uh, one or two days. But for the like RNA technology, it's uh, probably takes like, as long as like five days to totally kill the insects. So that's a cause we are cause some problem for resistance management because it's a slow killing. Sometimes like uh, you will along some hard zygous insects, that means you have some resistance earlier to survive in the whole population. And in the long term, these resistance earlier frequency can be increased for the whole overall population. And this will accelerate the evolution of resistance and uh, the RNA technology can fast lose its efficacy. All right, I'm gonna give you two questions in one here and this is gonna wrap us up here. So the first one is asking just, is there any more information about uh, whether or not beetles will lay eggs or corner worm adults will lay eggs in soybean fields and what's going on there? But then also, how about volunteer corn? How is that affecting things too with corner worm? And I'll leave it at that. Okay, so for a first question, for Western corn worm laying like eggs in soybean, as I mentioned, those are variants. So we don't we don't have any variants, especially like in Minnesota. So there's like a variants like populations only like in Iowa and Nebraska areas. So that's good news for our Minnesota population. 
So we don't have any like Western cold room can lay eggs in a soybean field this year. And maybe we don't, if you find something, let me know. So maybe we have some variants migrate from other places. And for the, for the second question, uh, could you remind me for the second question? Uh, uh, basically volunteer corn. How is that affecting okay. oh, yeah. the situation? So, so for the volunteer corn uh, in the field, so uh, it depends. So if we like uh, most of your area, uh, uh, Western corn rootworm, and the, normally they don't travel like uh, very, as I mentioned, they are not like a mobile compared to northern corn rootworm. So most of the Western corn rootworm, they will lay eggs in your local corn fields. But for northerns, if you, uh, they can travel to your uh, other fields. So if you have volunteer corn in your soybean, so they will lay eggs there, and uh, these eggs probably will hatch like uh, in, in the future, so it will cause problems. So it's better like if you have lots of volunteer corn and if you have high populations of northern corn rootworm, it's a, it's a good idea to control for those like a volunteer corn in your fields. Again, thank you for everyone for attending today's Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program. Uh, and thanks to our sponsors, Minnesota Soybean Research Promotion Council and Minnesota Corn Research Promotion Council. And again, I want to thank Dr. Fei Yang for uh, Chat, chatting with us today pretty much this whole hour here on all of our corn insect issues. Thanks again.